is almost as bad as my desktop in my office. Uh, I'd like to start out also by thanking the organizers, in particular Ann and Chris, for inviting me here. Um, I want to put forward a disclaimer right away. I am an experimentalist by training, and so this talk will be given from the point of view of an experiment, an experimentalist. Um, some of you who know me realize I had a postdoc in the Solid State Theory Group, and one of the main lessons I learned there, it was an important lesson, that is, the best way to get a theorist involved in a calculation is to do it yourself, and then do it incorrectly. And then they do it, <laughs> and they get involved really quickly. <laughs> That's my perspective here. Um, we've done some uh, scattering calculations, I'll show you. They're very primitive compared to the capabilities that exist within this audience. Um, the overview is um, going to be sort of presenting work that's been done very recently by Anton Sidorov, and then there are two very talented graduate students who contributed to this activity. Um, our work in this area is funded by uh, the uh, Department of Energy, Atomic Molecular and Optical Physics Program. Okay, so I want to give a little bit of an overview at the very beginning with regard to the importance of understanding inelastic scattering of low energy electrons, um, particularly with respect to DNA damage, but more generally with respect to understanding radiation damage. And if you uh, think about it, it, it's very clear that high energy particles lose energy primarily via inelastic scattering events, which are primarily ionization. So direct production of electrons and then electronic excitation. These electronically excited states can decay by a number of channels, in particular OJ decay or electron emission, autoionization. All of these channels uh, serve to produce uh, low energy secondary electrons. Um, a good rule of thumb is the sum of these inelastic channels produce on the order of, say, for an MeV particle interacting with the target, where in this case M is big M, 10 to the 6, I uh, generate 10 to the 4 secondary electrons. And these 10 to the 4 secondary electrons have to interact with your target. Uh, specifically, in this case, we're going to be concerned about DNA, but it's not just, just DNA, it's, it's your collision target. And then you're going to be concerned with the convolution integral, which is the number density of secondary electrons, which typically peak in energy around 10 to 15 eV, interacting with the target, and you have your energy loss function. And this turns on about 10 eV, and it's dominated by ionization. So ionization is the direct channel, but we're going to look at the interactions of the secondary electrons, and you're going to realize that there's these uh, resonances here that when you do the convolution integral, they're going to be pretty important with regard to understanding the radiation damage to the particular target. Uh, we see here written DEA resonances, and I'm going to show you something which I find amusing, and everybody in this audience probably already knows what DEA uh, corresponds to or what that acronym is all about. But it turns out if you go and you look on the web <laughs> what DEA is, what do you think you get, right? It's clearly the drug enforcement agency. <laughs> There's no question about it. That's the one that gets the most hits. If you go a little bit further, it's actually a psychological disease suffered by small children. The E part of it's missing. That's primarily just dissociative attachment. Uh, and finally, it's a negative ion resonance, which decays to form an anion fragment. And obviously, this is the one that we care about with regard to this talk. And I'll give you a little bit more detail in particular about how resonance scattering can contribute rather significantly to the damage of DNA. And one of the main points of the talk is the experiments really require some theory to help us understand what are the uh, real, what's the real physics here. A lot of this work was stimulated by a very important paper by Leon Sanch more than a decade ago in science where they clearly demonstrated that there was resonances in the formation of DNA strand breaks induced by low energy electrons, and low energy here is subionization electrons interacting with a DNA target, and then you have a resonance scattering effect, and you can have right here on the left, this is called a DSB, which is a double strand break, and you can see a resonant structure here in the break probability, then below that is the single strand break, there's also resonance structure here, and there's loss of supercoiled DNA. So in this particular experiment, they were looking at a coiled DNA, a supercoiled plasmid, 
and this is unraveling. You can't see this very well, but the yield is one in 10 to the minus four for the double strand breaks, and the yield of about a factor of 10 higher for the single strand breaks. On the right side here is the H minus yield from the constituent parts of DNA. This would be sort of a prototypical base. You can see the H minus come up, there's some resonance structure, and then it comes down and comes back up. Uh, this is the H minus yield from water, so these are the well-known dissociative attachment resonances of water. Uh, this is the WB1 state. I've shown here uh, in green the uh, yield from the WB2 state primarily. This one doesn't actually make H minus, it decays to form O minus. And this is a little bit misleading because it indicates that these have the same relative yields. This is about an order of magnitude smaller cross-section. Here is a sugar, prototypical sugar, and you can also see resonances here. So the bottom line is DNA, the constituent parts of DNA can support negative ion resonances. The DNA itself, the break probability, shows resonance structure. So in general, one has to care about resonance scattering processes. I put the green here, which is essentially this uh, level here from the WB2 level, and it shows that this could be contributing to the double strain break probability. I want to make that clear because there's a lot of um, reactive entities that are formed from resonance scattering with water. And so one of the messages here is that water fragments, in particular H minus OH, O, and O minus from the hydration waters are likely involved, particularly in the double strand break probability. And some of that lesson comes from uh, discussions with my biophysics colleagues who says that hydration water is always there and, and when they are not. So when you don't consider hydration water, then don't consider DNA DNA. Okay, without the water, it doesn't really behave as DNA should. Okay, so what are these resonances? Well, in particular, we're going to concern ourselves with uh, core excited shape and core excited Feshbach resonances, which are classic one hole, two electron states. I can have a direct excitation with an incoming electron that can be trapped into this excited state. So I have a one hole, two electron resonance. And uh, if it's below the initial parent excited state, it's a Feshbach resonance. Above it, it's the core excited shape resonance. And then these can decay to form bound anions or anions. And uh, a typical experiment is you scan the electron energy and you look at the uh, production yield of ions or anions as a function of incident energy. And you can see things will turn on around 5 eV, go up and down, and then come back up again as we get to these ion pair surfaces. This is exactly what the H minus yield from DNA looks like from its constituent parts. So it looks like clearly DNA damage may involve uh, one hole, two electron type states. Uh, there's lower energy shape resonances that can contribute where we have a single particle shape resonances. They can also decay to form stable anion fragments of reactive radicals, but the uh, incident energy could be uh, well below 5 eV down to the 1 eV level. So much, much lower excitation energy. So you can get fairly efficient uh, break probability of DNA by simply exciting a very low energy shape resonance. And so most of the resonance scattering, scattering channels that are available could lead to effective damage of DNA. Okay, so here's a cartoon. And pay attention to the fact that this is a cartoon for electron-induced DNA damage. We're going to go through four steps. So I have my target. I don't know why I chose this color. It's, it's not because it's close to Christmas time. <laughs> the, the, uh, I chose it mostly because of the red berries here. These are oxygens that are correlated with water along the grooves of DNA. And this is sort of a, a simple 10 base pair sequence where you can have a full twist. Okay, so I have an incoming electron and it can excite, excite a, uh, a resonance, uh, which we think is a, a compound Feshbach resonance. And that incoming electron is maybe correlated why I say a compound resonance. I've written WB2 here because that represents the excited state of water, the anion resonance of water that decays to form O minus, which would, could be coupled to a base or a phosphate, even the sugar. When this decays, it can kick off a very slow electron and it can produce the fragments of water. Okay, so the, the, the uh, slow electron comes off as well as reactive oxygen fragments and that can lead to a strand break right here. That slow electron that comes off can then uh, scatter over a certain scattering distance 
and excite a lower energy shape resonance. Okay? And this low energy shape resonance would, could be on the other side of the DNA and on a different part of the strand, albeit within a few lattice sites. And then it could lead to a localized double strand break. Okay? And so if I sum up steps one, two, three, I have a compound Festbach resonance, a single strand break here, a low energy scattering event here, which is more like a shape resonance, another break here, the sum of those leads to a double strand break. Sounds like a nice story. I think it may very well be a story unless we have some really good theory to back this up. I would say this is the very important role of theory, is can we model these resonances and dynamics well? And there's some very good calculations for the constituent parts of DNA, some calculations for small pieces of DNA, and very little that takes into account the, the full scattering and then the coupling between the water. So we really do need theory to see if this is a fact or fiction. Now I want to show you some experimental work as well as some theory that we've done that sort of has led us to go down this path. And I have to say that much of the work that's been done in this general area has been by Leon Sanchez group. So we're, we're following in his footsteps in many, many cases. The scattering calculation we've done is simply that. It's a diffraction calculation, so it's very primitive compared to what kind of theory can be carried out by the people in the audience. But it, I want to show you that it does lead us in the direction which we think is useful. Uh, the fact that Festbach resonances and interfacial water are involved come from experiment. And uh, one of the things we do is we, we go to the protein database and we can pull out the um, indices and geometrical coordinates of the, the, the um, crystallized DNA and it gives us the positions, relative positions of the structural waters and that's quite important. And then we do a sort of a scattering calculation. So this is a, an example of one of the fragments we've, that we've uh, calculated the fraction in. And the, the calculation is a, a very straightforward one. Uh, like I said, fairly primitive. Uh, we start out with the uh, one electron excitation by uh, Fermi's Golden Rule and we look at the incoming electron interacting with the target electron. And we have a, a fairly simple representation for the excitation from the initial to final state. Um, a complicated electron-electron interaction Hamiltonian, the density of initial to final states, uh, a delta function to conserve energy. And this is very difficult to evaluate and so what we do is we, we, we really simplify it. So we ignore exchange and, uh, and then correlation we ignore all the final state details and then we write down this fairly simple expression with the screen coulomb operator and in the end all we really do is calculate sort of the uh, overlap integral psi star psi that happens just due to diffraction or elastic scattering. So all we're doing is we're doing an elastic scattering calculation. So we do not deal with any electronic structure effects or any dynamic polarization or any coupling to the solvent and unfortunately this is where we really need to do the work. Um, this is where most of the uh, information is and we don't touch this. We just look at waving up the tube buildup just due to geometric uh, effects. But even so, doing that simple calculation is uh, instructive. Uh, we don't need to go through the details of this. I just want to point out that we've not done anything new at all. Um, we've just used codes that were developed by John Rear for XF's uh, calculations and it's the utilization of his separable curve-wave representation of this free space propagator, this Green's function-based approach. And so it's all basically using XF theory, uh, but applying it to this uh, diffraction problem. The work was all done by Matt Seeger with some very strong input from a, a formal colleague at uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, Greg Schenter. So, we even simplify it further because this is a multiple scattering formalism where we have our introduction and termination matrices over some angular momentum. Uh, we actually just go, we don't do the multiple scattering, we just do first order scattering. We do a point excitation so we, we sum up all the wave amplitudes on different uh, uh, sites and then just pop, you know, plot out the overall amplitude as a function of, of energy and angle. There's an inter this is a solid state approach, so we need an inner potential, which we extracted from the literature. So the bottom line is if you do this calculation and you plot up the amplitudes over all of the uh, sugar available sugar sites, 
it, it's pretty boring. You see a, a fairly large amplitude buildup for excitation energies below 50 dB. Um, basically the same thing for the phosphates. There seems to be some structure that's present there. But uh, when you look at the waters that are in this calculation, then you find out that a lot of the, uh, that there is some oscillation reproducible, uh, which is primarily on the waters of hydration, and in particular those waters that are within the first shell. And this structure changes a little bit depending upon the base pair sequence. Okay, so this is the beauty of theory from my perspective is experimentally it's impossible really to control the number of waters and, the, and their positions within the major group and minor group. You can sort of localize it to just the first shell experimentally, but you really can't tell much more than that. Uh, in the um, a calculation, what we've done is we've used 23 water molecules along this 10 base pair sequence, and all of these are within the inner shell so no outer shell uh, water is included. And by inner shell, I mean within an 8 to 10 angstrom distance away from the, the DNA. And then you can have them within the major groove or the minor groove. And when you look at the amplitudes on the major groove versus the minor groove waters, you find out that the, the um, oscillations are almost entirely on the major groove waters and not much on the minor groove waters. So if there's any diffraction, it seems like it may be related to the the uh, relative uh, amount of water that's present within the major groove. Okay, so that's the extent of the theory, and it's, it's, it's uh, a fairly primitive approach. Uh, our, our expertise is in doing experiments, so we've developed two techniques to look at DNA damage with low energy electrons, and one of them is uh, very similar to the approach uh, initially carried out by Leon Sanchez's group, where we spin cotoplasmid DNA on a film, this is an ultra-high vacuum, then we irradiate it with a pulse electron beam, and then we do it in a, in a way such that we have a, a, a linear response in the dose so that it's a single electron scattering event, and then we can analyze the DNA fragments or the DNA damage using post-irradiation gel electrophoresis. So I'll show you some results there. And then we've uh, moved on and we've done an, an, another experiment where we've uh, done radiation in ultra-high vacuum with a, a re redesigned gun with a different substrate because the substrate in this case actually does matter. Typically we use thick film so that we uh, remove the substrate. But we decided to put this on a gold-colored silicate substrate and then I'll show you some very exciting results where we do this on graphene that's uh, deposited on uh, this gold-colored silicate. And then the DNA damage is then analyzed with Brahman microspectroscopy. So we can, and it turns out this is much more sensitive to the gel, than the gel electrophoresis technique. Um, the gel electrophoresis technique is, I take the sample, I have this um, plasmid DNA, which is the circular uh, DNA sample. If I have a single strand break, it's a break here, maybe a break here, even though there's two single strand breaks, that doesn't count as a double strand break. Uh, the double strand break is here where they're in close proximity to one another. And if this is on a plasmid DNA, if I have a single strand break, it's just a nick and it nicks the circle. But if I have a double strand break, this circle can unravel and now it's a linear chain. And the mobilities of these under an applied electric field that's used in gel electrophoresis is vastly different. So you can determine the number of single strand breaks versus the double strand breaks. Let me say something here. It's, it's, uh, the double strand breaks, which the biophysicists and the biologists uh, think are most important with regard to carcinogenesis. Single strand breaks form rather readily, but they're repaired very uh, efficiently within cells. It's actually the misrepair of a double strand break and the propagation of that misrepair, which is correlated with cancer. So the double strand break probability and understanding these, which is pretty important with regard to understanding radiation-induced carcinogenesis. Now when we do these experiments, we have, a, like I said, on the onset we use fairly thick films uh, so that we kind of minimize the substrate interaction. Total dose is about 10 to the 13 electrons per square centimeter. And then we did this a, as a function of incident electron energy, analyzed the gels and then analyzed the fluorescence intensity underneath these bars and determined the amount of single strand breaks versus double strand breaks as a function of uh, incident electron energy. And we can plot this and 
show you that, in fact, you can see resonance structure in the break probability. Uh, the density of points is a little bit sparse because these are very complicated measurements. But if you look at our, our results, uh, these are the, the single strand break probability as a function of incident electron energy. And you can see there appear to be some structure here and some structure here. Uh, and then the double strand breaks are similar, but the overall uh, efficacy of the double strand breaks is about, in our measurements, about a factor of three or five less than the single strand break probability. Uh, shown on this graph also are the output of the calculation where you can see these, uh, this, this resonance structure for scattering of the water in the major groove for a B DNA sequence and uh, can, uh, we've done it for an A DNA sequence which is a, a little bit different in terms of the, the local structure. You can also see resonances or, or oscillations in the amplitude and I've just plotted them up here just for the sake of qualitative comparison. Okay, and they qualitatively sort of fall in the general regimes where we see experimentally some resonance structure. What I've shown up here is the positions of the Feshbach resonances known to exist in condensed water. Okay, so the WB1 state, which is making H minus, is here, and the WB2 state, which we think makes take O minus or O atoms, is sitting here. So, since these waters are present in our experiment in terms of the, the uh, target, uh, we really think that we can't ignore them and we think that when we look at these states we may want to think of compound states which actually is an admixture of the resonance structure for the water and what might be existing on the constituent part of the DNA. Now the question is we can't resolve the a single strand break threshold nor the double strand break threshold. If you recall, and I didn't point this out, in, in the initial measurement by Leon Sange, he showed that the double strand break threshold was somewhere around 5 eV, but the uh, single strand break threshold was considerably lower in energy, but not well resolved. So we'll get to that point because the uh, single strand break threshold is actually at very low energy, and that's because shape resonances are involved in that process. Um, like I said, we then changed the experiment a little bit, and we moved towards using a graphene substrate as the place where we adsorbed our our, 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 our single-stranded DNA or our double-stranded DNA. So we now have a, a different target, which is a silicon uh, substrate with a silicon oxide overlayer, a little bit of gold on top, and then there's a very thin sheet, a single layer of graphene that's on top of the gold, and then the RNA is then placed on top of that. And then we put it into the chamber, and then we irradiate this with low-energy electrons, and in this case, we can get below 1 eV. And we set up an experiment we do where we irradiated the uh, single-stranded DNA, looked at the damage, and we looked at the uh, damage that occurs due to less than one eV electrons interacting with the target. Once we did the irradiation, we took the sample out and we analyzed the data with the Raman microscope. Now, one of the reasons why we were interested in looking at it on graphene is because there have been calculations which indicate that the RNA can bind onto the graphene, and in this case we had p-doped monolayer graphene, which were, indicates that there's domains of positive charge on the graphene, and these positive charges can interact with the phosphates, and you can have the phosphates interacting with the graphene in an, you know, electrostatically, which is a reasonably strong coupling versus the dispersion forces typically associated with DNA interacting with graphite. And because of the p-doping nature, it also can have a repulsive effect with regard to its interaction with some of the bases. So guanine uh, could be kind of lifted up with respect to its coupling of the substrate. So you can have a situation where you have the phosphates and the sugars more intimately interacting with the graphene and the bases sort of, sort of above the plane, sort of as antennas that then can collect electrons from direct scattering. And you can have some indirect scattering that's going on within the graphene and ballistic electron transport to the phosphate sugar groups and, uh, and potentially really enhance the damage. So this is the, uh, the idea is DNA damage can involve direct electron transfer to phosphate groups. These would be extremely low energy resonances and, and they'd, they'd be enhanced because of the number that are interacting with the graphene. And indeed, one of the things we see is a really, really high break probability with these films. So if you, if you take them, you disperse them onto the, uh, 
the graphene and you take a Raman spectra, you get a beautiful Raman spectra. Um, of all of the different vibrational modes associated with the, uh, the sugars, the phosphates, the bases, and the, uh, and the, uh, the uh, phosphate uh, asymmetric stretch and the, and the phosphate symmetric stretch, what's interesting is then I irradiate it with one, less than an EV electron, I have a very, very high break probability, which can be visualized in, in sort of a, a chemically specific way and a sequence specific way. I don't want to get into the details of this, but this is very sequence specific. So there's an extremely facile breakage of the DNA for excitation energies uh, below one volt. And the question is, are these due to shape resonance? Over on the right here is something we do not understand, and we need some help theoretically to figure this out. If you take the Araman spectra of all of these, they all have water. Even if you let them sit in vacuum and pump them, they all have the um, first shell of water. Uh, if you look at the sequence dependence of the break probability, the one that breaks the most is mostly guanine um, and adenine, and the water is almost completely obliterated. So water starts out the same. The amount of remaining water is, gone, is, is variable, and it needs to be there for the break probability to be as high as it is. Okay, are shape resonances involved? Well, the answer is yes, and this is because there was a very influential paper also written by Leon Sanchez's group, which shows that the threshold for double single strand breaks is near zero EV. And then it goes up and it goes down, and if you go through this paper, their um, conclusions are that single strand breaks are correlated primarily in this paper with base high star shape resonances. I think these are the shape resonances uh, for finding. Okay, now it's an interesting thing that, you know, if you have this initiated on the base, you're looking at a, a, a single strand break, you have to move it to the CO bond and break the COP bond. So there's a suggestion that these pi star electrons are therefore then transferred to the sigma star level, which leads to a break. So there's this coupling or capturing of the electron on the base, and then it moves down to the, through the sugar to the phosphate, and then it breaks the sugar phosphate bond. The reason and how this happens, there have been some calculations I'll show, but I would argue that this is not well understood and requires more theory. Uh, you can see here the double strand break probability is not uh, showing up until at least greater than 4 EV, probably <coughs> greater than 5, okay? Most of the work done on this uh, in terms of the mechanism is by Jack Simons in Utah. And there's this uh, concept chemical research paper that summarizes a lot of it. And this is the picture that came out of this as you have a pi star resonance, a shape resonance initially localized on the base. There's some through bond transfer to the uh, sugar, and then there's a breakage of this COP bond right here. And then Jack indicates that this is a general phenomenon, but the mechanisms for this through base charge transfer is not clear. I'll be done in a few minutes. This is a calculation which approaches a, 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 this problem, and they've done the calculation, so this is the only base that Jack didn't calculate. He didn't calculate guanine. He, he did all of the other ones. So here's a, a simple guanine monophosphate. He did a DFT calculation, and you can see that in this case, the electron is sort of the distributed dipole bound electron between the base and the phosphate. And then there's a transition state for this electron to move over to the sigma star level. And the barrier is on the order of 10 to 3 kcals per mole. They did an important thing here, and that is they did the DFT calculation plus water treated using a polarizable continuum model to try and get to what the water might be doing here. And then they did a calculation, the DFT calculation with the waters explicitly included, and they were able to see a remarkable drop in the barrier height for this charge to move from one place to the next, which is mediated by the water, or mediated by the coupling of the water. So that's down to a very low a barrier, so this is helping the charge to move from one point to the next. So that this needs to be looked at because this is a static calculation, there is no dynamics. Okay, so in conclusion, there are single strand breaks that in, in, happen at very, very low energies and from the predominant data from the Alan Sanchez group and calculations from Jack Simons and others, these likely involve base pi star shape resonances and somehow this charge density has to get to the sigma star states to do the breakage, to lead to the breakage. 
Double strand brakes require more energy. They look like they require sort of core excited Feshbach resonances, possibly compound resonances, and those compound resonances uh, necessarily involve probably water. Um, this wasn't the point of the talk, but graphene using this as a, a, a good substrate actually enhances the brake probability, so it provides from an experimental point of view a good platform to look very explicitly at the sequence dependence of the damage and the role of the phosphates versus the bases directly. And the bottom line is, since this is a theory workshop, it is true that we need much more theoretical treatment, and in particular, a way to merge electron scattering theory with electronic structure calculations and try to do this where we can get the scattering and the electronic structure together in the same calculation. And I think that would make this field move further much quicker. So in this case, I think the experimentalists really, really need the theorists. And on that note, I'm going to end by also saying the explicit role of water also must necessarily be taken into account because that is part of the target. And I want to thank Doogie Wu, who did most of this work, and Frank Chen, and unfortunately Anton Spitcher is not here because he's a fairly new addition to the group. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions and hopefully it stimulated some interest in doing calculations along these lines. Yeah, okay, so I, I skipped that uh, because of the time. So we've done sequence dependence uh, of the break probability, and uh, there's a, a recent paper out of Germany, a group in Germany who also did a very low energy electron induced damage experiment using a fluorescence uh, detection technique, a little bit more complicated than our direct measurement. And they, they indicated that guanine was important as well. So that is one of the reasons why we did that. And we chose a sequence that was only guanine and adenine. And we had sequences that were only guanine and thymine, sequences as adenine, thymine, and adenine, and then, you know, so we had these variations of the sequences. And what we find is that uh, the, the, um, the damage probability goes up when we have uh, added guanine. The one I showed you was this one here guanine and, and 25 thymine, so that's mostly thymine. Uh, if we have a lot of adenine and less thymine, we get a lot higher break probability. If we have the adenine in the middle, it's even more. And here's the real break probability. If we have guanine in the middle and a lot of guanine, guanine in the middle and guanine on the sides, that one is obliterated. So there's no question to us that the, the predominance of guanine is the key to having high damage probabilities. And it looks like if you have guanines that are next to each other, uh, sort of three or four next to one another, that's even, even more dangerous. Um, it doesn't say anything about the particular structure. It just says about the sequence, because these are, these are single-stranded measurements. Uh, but we want to do, do part of the And you do not know, actually, if it's uh, breaks where it's primarily attaches the electron, or it breaks there regardless of where electron is attached, right? Right, okay, so we don't know that. So the only, we have to do very controlled sequence dependence measurements to try and get at that. And, and so we don't know if it's the initial site of attachment. And if you go to John Simon, I mean, excuse me, Jack Simon's calculation, he would say that most of the initial sites of attachment are bases, but they then transfer over to the sugar phosphate group, which is quite close to that base. Yeah, I just want to uh, add a word of caution about this pi star, sigma star that people like to do. People like to do this one-dimensional picture. And they like to talk about a pi star, they like to talk about a sigma star. The problem is, is you don't have something that's a linear molecule. And uh, I, we saw it for acetylene, Tom's going to probably talk about CO2, is as soon as things start moving, you break the symmetry, and then you just have whatever surface you're and so I think there's, a, there's, there's this one-dimensional model, and you, you had it up there with your, your pi star and your sigma star, and with this one-dimensional picture, and it is not the right picture for these things. So I agree. That, that's what I'm trying to thank you for conveying that, because it needs to move forward with this audience in terms of what the right theory is. I think 
Yep. So, so Tom, your graphing on gold, that's going to have imp both bound and resonance image potential states. Could not they not get engaged at threshold? Yes. Yes, and, and there's more to it than that because well, so the graphene is sitting on top of the gold, so there's not there's not any chemical interaction, but there is a, a proximity effect where there can be image coupling. Actually, the gold is not a really good gold surface; it's purposely roughened, and so um, the other thing that's happening here is these field enhancements are why we have such beautiful Raman spectra, because this is a surface enhanced Raman uh, signal that we see. So yes, having it on the substrate that has gold complicates it. But even in the absence of gold, even the graphene itself could have an image yes, potential Yes, right. Space. And that is something we're trying to calculate. Uh, David Sherrill at Georgia Tech is interested in this as well as Angelo Bongiorno. And that's, that's an area just right there is trying to understand just the, the, the coupling of the graphene to the, to the uh, yeah. DNA. Tom, we, we've looked at uh, looking for resonances in the, ph in the phosphate group and monomethyl, dimethyl, right. ester. And the, if they're there, they're very, very broad, I mean, up around 7 to 10 EB. Now, are you looking for pi star type resonances in the phosphate group? So, yeah, and I forgot to mention this. Most of the important contributors to the, the understanding of this are in this audience. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Vince, I'm sorry I forgot well, to mention this. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're talking to me, it's, uh, I'm a confusing individual. But, um, so we are looking at these. Um, Mono, the, the phosphates that you did calculations on and the, and the smaller ones in building up and, look, and looking for resonance structure to correlate them. We can now do this because of the new um, geometry that we can get to the lower energies because these resonances are below 5 EV, I think. But we see, anything we see is very broad around 7 to 10. 7 to 10. You don't see anything like a pi star resonance. The phosphate group's kind of funny what chemists think of it. But right, so I think in this case, the, the pi star resonances that we're talking about here, and they may not be the right um, assignment, are primarily on the basis. And then they move over to sigma star resonances that uh, are involved in, in breaking. Yeah, remind me again, why did you choose to put these things on graphene? Well, okay, it was a bias of Anton Sidorov, who's a real graphene expert, to be really honest. Um, and we wanted to try, the other reason is we wanted to see the damage probability more sequence specific or bond specific. And you can't see that with the gel electrophoresis. You just see if you have a strand break or a single strand break or a double strand break. So the idea was to do Raman microscopy of this and try to get it so that it's the, we thought it uh, on the onset it would be the least interacting substrate. That's not necessarily true. Um, and, and, and so the driver was from an experimental point of view too because we were aware of the fact that we could get strong Raman signatures of this. Oh, okay. You know, just a quick question. Do you, do you take a DNA sequence that has the base pairs more aligned with what you expect of humans when you do these sorts of things? We can do that now. Uh, we, this was sort of a proof of principle to get it going. And we chose these to try and see if there's some domain size that's large enough that we can not only see with a Raman microscopy, but to correlate it with AFM or scanning probe technique. But yeah, that's an obvious thing to do is to go to one that is, has function. Yeah. Uh, these don't necessarily have function. We also chose these so that they don't fold upon themselves and so that they're not interacting with themselves. So we had to choose sequences that were well behaved. It's interesting because one might see that evolution just line them up just as So that they don't, so that's an interesting point. And, and so this business of the guanine being important, it turns out that if you look at those, there's this thing called the telomere, which is at the beginning. And that sequence is very guanine rich and that's the one that breaks. And then the rest is, seems to be okay. So yeah, there are probably things that can be unraveled. What do you use to dope the graphene? Yeah, okay, so that's a, it's, it's self-doping in the way that it's made. Um, it's mostly what people think is mo mostly oxygen. Uh, there's this chemical vapor deposition of, um, and there's methane and a helium argon flow, but it's not, there's some water that's present. So we think it's probably water, but it's not, you know, so there's maybe some epoxides, there are some defects or damage within the graphene, but it's
it's not that well characterized. The fact that it's p-dope is because we've measured this with uh, electrostatic force microscopy, and you can measure the, the, the potentials. Uh, but you know, the, you know what's directly causing the p-doping isn't chemically resolved. But you deliberately chose. We deliberately chose that because we knew that it was p-dope. Well, he knew that it was p-dope. I didn't know it was p-dope. Anton. Probably we can continue discussion using the coffee break Okay, thank you.